Christopher Hitchens was the writer, author, thinker, atheist, anti-God influencer of, a, of an earlier generation, kind of a previous generation. One of the things he said is this. <clears throat> we'll start us off today. Religion is poison because it asks us to give up our most precious faculty, which is that of reason, and to believe things without evidence. It then asks us to respect this which it calls faith. The assumption there, then, that faith is something that is believed not with any reason, but without evidence. He later goes on to kind of suggest this, then. What can be asserted without evidence can be dismissed without evidence. And so his conclusion is that religion, because there is no evidence, can be easily dismissed, not taken seriously. And so, let's ask the question, is there any evidence? If there is evidence, then it cannot be simply dismissed, but needs to be taken seriously. And therefore, maybe it's not poisonous. That's the question we're asking. Does it make sense to have faith? Because even if you don't approach your faith with a kind of philosophical or intellectual approach, I I believe that we ask the question... Does it, um, how can I be sure? Like, I believe, and I really want to believe, but every now and then those thoughts creep into my mind. Like, can I be sure? Can I be sure that God exists? Can I be sure that the Bible is reliable? Can I be sure that Christianity is good for culture and society? Can I be sure? And in these weeks, I'm attempting to offer a response. I want you to consider that, yes, there is evidence for faith, and yes, Christianity can stand the test of reason in science. Last week, we started off with the most basic question, can I be sure that God exists? Does that, does that, um, because I haven't seen God, then since I haven't seen God, can I infer from observing the world around me that God exists? And Well, here's the four ways that I would go about it. I would suggest this. Number one, the scientific laws of inertia, gravity, and entropy suggest that God exists. When observing the world from the perspective of design and uh, intelligence, and especially design, I would suggest that science tells us that the complexity of of the world, the complexity and design in the universe that we see suggests that God exists. Coming at it from more kind of a social sciences perspective, we see this sense of right and wrong, and we see it in every culture around the world. I would suggest that this universal, the best explanation for a system of right and wrong in every culture in the world, is not that we invented it, but that God gave it. And we see in the world around us, in every culture, we see a religious system, we see some kind of spiritual beliefs, or at least a seeking for some God force power that's bigger and greater than us. What can explain the presence of religion and, or some kind of spiritual belief in every culture around the world? I would suggest to you the best explanation for a religious or spiritual beliefs in every culture in the world is a God who truly exists. And maybe you don't like any one of these, but I would suggest, or maybe no, maybe one of these isn't sufficient for you, but when you put all of them together, looking at all four of these angles, the best conclusion that I come up to, that I can come up with, is that I am sure God exists. That was last week's summary. If you want the longer version, all the details in between, go to our YouTube channel, go to our church website, and the media page, it's there, you can check it out, you can listen to it, you can watch it, or any of your favorite podcast providers, you can find it there. We didn't stop there, though, because it's not enough to just kind of stop at belief, because in the end, faith is not just an intellectual pursuit. Think of what we just said and the implications of this God we believe exists. We've said he's powerful, that he's intelligent, that he cares how we live and the choices we make, and he wants us to seek him. If God gave a sense of religious seeking, then he wants us to seek him. And if a powerful, intelligent being who cares how we live and wants us to seek him actually exists, we should seek him. But if I'm going to seek him, I want to know something about him. And I want to know more about this God that I'm seeking than just the simple fact that he's powerful, that he's intelligent. 
Like, like if he gave us a moral sense of right and wrong, I want to know more than just that there is right and wrong. I want to know what God believes about what is right and what is wrong. And if God put a sense of religious seeking in every one of us, I want to know what he wants from me. I want to know what he wants for me. I want to know how he wants us to seek him so that we can seek him in the way that this powerful, intelligent God wants to be sought. And you know what? The good news is God knows that too. In fact, what we believe, I believe this, God wants you to seek him, and God wants you to know him far more than you want to know him. And so God revealed himself to us. We read, we read in the story uh, in the Bible, this guy named Moses, and he's just tending his sheep, right, one day, and God shows a, like a burning bush that burns and doesn't burn up, and he goes over, and God speaks to him from the bush, and God reveals himself to Moses, tells Moses about him from the bush. That God gives Moses and the people the Ten Commandments and the other laws because he cares how they want, how he, he cares about how they live, the choices we make, and he reveals his will to them. He sends prophets and he says, hey, here's a special message that you need to hear. And those prophets, they say, this is the word of God. And they tell them the message. Well, then a bunch of people wrote it down. We have it in our Bibles of how God revealed himself. And when you read your Bible, you can discover who God is. But God wasn't content to just give words and messages through people. God really wanted to make sure we know who he is. And so God became one of us. Jesus, the Son of God who had sat at the right hand of the Father from all eternity, was born as a human and lived a completely human life. God as a human so that we could make no mistake about what God is like. If you want to know what God is like, look at Jesus and you'll see exactly what God is like and what he wants for you, what he wants from you. Thankfully, four guys, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they were inspired by God to write down a lot of what Jesus said, what he did, what happened around him. And they got the story. And here we are 2,000 years later. We have the word of God. We have the written word of God that reveals the living word of God who is Jesus. And by knowing the word of God through the written word and the living word, we can know God himself who wants us to seek him. The problem, the question. What we want to be sure about, we ask is, how do I know that what we read in our Bibles is what Jesus actually said? I mean, looking at ancient culture, writing and writing it down, and there were no smartphones and modern electronic communications. They lived in an oral culture. They were really good storytellers. And they lived in an oral, oral culture in which stories and instructions and these sayings were told orally and passed down through generations orally until finally somebody wrote it down. And well, the accusation goes like this. You take a guy who was great and people loved like Jesus, he did some really great things. He might have fed a few people with a meal and stretched it a little bit, but then the story was told and it told again and told again and told again and the legend grew to eventually the legend became Jesus fed 5,000 people with one lunch when actually you go back and the legend was based on a time when he just fed a few people. But the story was exaggerated, became a legend. And so what we have is not what Jesus actually said and did. It's the result of a legend. Or when it was finally written down, without the use of printing press, someone copied the copy and someone made another copy of the copy and little errors accumulated. And here we are 2,000 years later and our Bibles are the results of accumulation of copy errors. How can I be sure that what I have in my Bible that I bought at Walmart is actually what Jesus said and did and reveals God accurately. Can I be sure? Here's the question we're asking today. Can I be sure the Bible is reliable? Here we go. Well, the place to start then is let's look at what is claimed in the Bible. And let's look and see if we can find any clues that help us understand and answer the question, can I, can I, is the Bible reliable? By looking at what the Bible says. And the, the, way, the first thing we can kind of look at is the reference to specific eyewitnesses. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they all write these accounts of the story of Jesus, the telling of Jesus, the teachings of Jesus. Their accounts are just kind of from slightly different angles. Here's what, well, here's, here's how Luke starts it off. It's really fascinating. Before he gets into the story, it's kind of the introduction. Luke chapter 1, verse 1, starting right at the beginning. Here's what he says. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those 
from, by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. In other words, Luke is saying there's a whole bunch of people who are writing down the life of Jesus, the teachings of Jesus. Some of those accounts are varying and they're differing. So, verse 3, with this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. Evidently, Theophilus, whoever he was, was asking the question, can I be sure that what I've heard about Jesus is what he actually did and what he actually said? Because if what I've heard about Jesus is what he actually did and what he actually said, I'm going to live for that guy. If anybody can predict their own death and resurrection, I'm going to follow that guy. That's what we're going to especially talk about next week. Can I be sure Jesus lived, rose, died again, just like the Bible said? Come back for that. But before we get there, we're going to have to answer this question. Can I like accept what it said about him or anything in the Bible as well? And he says, Theophilus, I know you're asking the question, can I be sure? So I'm writing an orderly account based on my own eyewitness, based on my own research. This in mind, I have carefully investigated everything from the beginning because maybe at some point Luke also wanted to be sure and he did his own investigation. I investigated everything from the beginning. In other words, he probably went back and he found Mary, the mother of Jesus, and said, tell me again how it went. And with a note for detail trying to get the story right because he wanted an orderly account. He wrote it down just as Mary told him. He went and interviewed the eyewitnesses who were there. Now think about this. What we find in the Gospel of Luke is not just a collection of nice stories, parables, sayings, poems. Those things are great. What we find are dates, I mean references to specific events, references to specific people, to specific places at a specific time all of which could be verified by all the others who were there. And if, as the story goes and sometimes goes, that Luke was just trying to, he fabricated a story based on a lie, think about this. There are way too many specific details here that could be easily discredited by anybody who disagreed with them. And in the first century Rome, there were a lot of people who didn't like Jesus and didn't like the followers of Jesus. There were a lot of enemies who wanted to discredit the way of Jesus. In fact, Luke tells us the names and stories of people who didn't like Jesus, who could have been, if that's not how it went down, could have said, that's not how the story went. It, was, it would have been so easy to discredit Luke and everything he wrote because he gives the details. One of the evidences, as we see in the story, is that if it's not true, there were far too many people who could have said, and who, who it would have benefited them to say, no, it never happened that way. We don't see that. Well, how about the next question? When you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we find that, well, sometimes there's differences in how they tell the stories. And one of the accusations is that the differences or the discrepancies between Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John prove that it's not reliable. What about that? Well, there's a guy named J. Warner Wallace who was a career uh, investigative detective, and his specialty was working cold cases. Cases for which there were no living eyewitnesses to be found, and he became quite good at solving cold cases by looking at all the evidence and putting the pieces together to solve the crime. Later, as you're going to hear in a minute, when he was interested in Jesus, he used his investigative methods, applied them to Scripture, and came to the conclusion that Jesus is for real and he lives for Jesus. When asked the question, what about the discrepancies between Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Do they discredit each other and challenge the reliability of Scripture? Here's what he answers. Check this out. One of the major challenges that skeptics put forward about the gospel writers is that they couldn't get their story straight. Whereas you believe that's not a problem because witnesses should never agree completely. How does that help in the case for the Gospels? Yeah, I, I, this is one of those areas that I, I, it didn't really stumble me. As I was looking at the Gospels for the first time, really just trying to mine out the words of Jesus, I was not interested in becoming a believer. I wasn't interested in, you know, in God's existence. I simply thought this Jesus guy might have some smart things to say. So I'm just kind of trying to mine out the red letters. And I saw right away that, I mean, as a cop, you're constantly seeing the contradictions or the apparent contradictions that exist between eyewitness accounts. And I saw the alleged contradictions that people typically point to in the Gospels, they're there. But I never was ever for a second stumbled by it because to me they were fully within what I expect 
in terms of apparent contradictions between eyewitnesses of the same event. I can tell you, I had a case once where uh, a murder occurred in Arsenio. I was about maybe an hour, a little less than an hour behind it. I had to get dressed in my suit and get out to the scene. It was a rainy night, and patrol officers, we, we usually tell them not to do this, but this particular night it was raining, so they put all the witnesses in the back seat of a patrol car, and they sat together for about 50 minutes before I got there, 5 -oh, 50 minutes, without any supervision, talking to each other before I got there. What a mess, because now I had three identical accounts from, you know, the same account three times, instead of what I want to see, which is the messy, seemingly contradictory, cluttered, uh, and what the heck's going on here kind of account. That's what you get with eyewitnesses. There are times when an eyewitness will tell you something, and you'll say, there's no way that could even have happened that way. I don't, I, I, it makes no sense. And then the next guy comes along and tells you something that puts the puzzle together for you and makes sense of the first person's account. As a matter of fact, we see that happening in the Gospels. We don't have contradictions. We have puzzle pieces that have interlocking pieces. So, for example, uh, Matthew will say that uh, Jesus walked along the Sea of Galilee and called the disciples, and they dropped their fish and everything they were doing and, and followed him. And I remember what, listening to that, reading that, and thinking, it's got to be some kind of li literary device. There's no way they just dropped everything as soon as he walks up and they start to follow him. It's not until you see another account. And by the way, it's interesting about the first account. In the first account, James and John are mending their nets. So there's no discussion as to why they're mending their nets. Something has broken them. And all of a sudden, they drop everything and follow Jesus. Well, the other account tells you that he walks along and talks to Peter and says, let's go out fishing. And Peter says, ah, we've been fishing all day. There's no fish out there. No, get in the boat. We're going to go fishing. And they catch such a huge load of fish that it breaks the nets. So now this account tells you why they left and also why they were mending their nets. But the first account doesn't tell you any of this. And so when you see that people give you aspects of the account that come together and explain each other, a uh, pastor named J.J. Blunt in the 19th century called this undesigned coincidences of the gospel. I call this unintentional eyewitness support. This guy is telling me something. This guy is telling me something. And only together do I get the robust picture of what actually happened. So I'm not at all dissuaded by the fact that there are seeming contradictions. It's our job as the detective to figure out, well, is it a geographic perspective? Is it an emotional perspective? Is it some history of the, the witness itself that causes them to see one thing at, what the, at the expense of another? And we have to look at those and try to explain why we have differences. And that has never stopped us, though, from using these witnesses reliably in court. Okay, <clears throat> so when we look internally, we don't find contradictions, problems that discredit the whole thing. The second angle that we kind of look at this is what we call external evidence. Let me introduce with a little, this kind of little, little story here. So it's about 1947, just outside of the city of Jerusalem, about 13 miles east. There are a bunch of shepherds, and some of their sheep have disappeared, and they're trying to find them. Well, in this particular region where they were, um, there were a lot of hills, a lot of mountains, and there were several caves in the area. And this particular group of, group of caves were a little bit higher up, and so the shepherds didn't really want to climb up the mountain, go in and look for their sheep inside the caves. So someone had a great idea. Pick up a rock, chuck it into the cave, and it'll scare the sheep if they're in there. And if no sheep run out, that your sheep aren't there. So they pick up a rock, they chuck it into the cave, and they hear some glass. Well, not glass. They hear some breaking. They're like, there's something in there. Sounds like pottery breaking. They go in and they discover... A cave with several pieces of pottery, and inside the pottery clay pots, there are scrolls. They look at them, they discover there's many of them, they go find the authorities, and well, you can kind of read the whole rest of the history of the Dead Sea Scrolls and how that happened, but discovered inside of these caves, and this cave and other caves in the area, they found several, several, several ancient scrolls, and in them they found copies of the Old Testament. They found 19 copies of the book of Isaiah, 25 copies of the book of Deuteronomy, 30 copies of the Psalms. They discovered that these, this finding, these, were, these documents had been co um, copied and collected by an ancient group of Jews that lived about 100 years before Jesus who were really concerned about Roman occupation and other political and, um, and kind of ungodly influences. And so they made it their goal to copy, collect, and keep the scriptures safe. And they hid them and they stayed hid for almost a full 2,000 years. One of the best finds was an entire copy of the book of Isaiah. You see, without a printing press that can bind the entire Bible into one book, it required handwritten several scrolls to contain all of the Old Testament. 
One of the scrolls contained the entire book of Isaiah, dated about a hundred years before Jesus. It has been called, I mean, the, the Dead Sea Scrolls has been called like the archaeological find of the century just because there's so much there that has just been, just been so amazing and so old. Because, here's why it's so significant. They found an entire book of the, a copy of the book of Isaiah that had been copied about 100 years before Jesus. The next oldest copy, full copy, of the book of Isaiah that we have that is the basis for our modern translations of the book of Isaiah was copied about 1,000 years after Jesus. So, what do you do? You take the manuscript that's 1,000 years after Jesus, upon which our Bibles are based, and you compare it to the manuscript that's 100 years before Jesus. 1,100 years for an error and a copy and a copy and a copy for a lot of errors to accumulate. And what did they discover? Gleason Archer, Old Testament scholar, Bible scholar, he wrote this. The Dead Sea Scrolls, books of Isaiah, proved to be word for word identical with our standard Hebrew Bible in more than 95% of the text. The 5% variation consisted chiefly of obvious slips of the pen and variations in spelling. See, here's the accusation that is often made. We don't have any of the originals written down by, you know, like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. None of our ancient documents of, 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 the, of the New Testament. Like, we can't take the book of Luke, the oldest one that we have, do DNA analysis on it, and find Luke's DNA in there from, like, his palm getting sweaty as he's writing, you know? Because we don't, we don't have it. We don't have any of the originals. What we have are copies of copies, and so we have to compare the copies. And, well, um, here, here's, you know, how, how you can imagine if someone makes a copy and then make a copy of a copy and a copy of a copy, it just gradually accumulates errors. Well, here, I, tr I tried this with, uh, I tried it myself. So I took like a, I took a recent family photo of our family um, on a snorkeling trip in Hawaii a couple of weeks ago, right? You can learn a lot about our family from looking at this, uh, this nice picture. Printed it off on our high quality color copy machine. I took the one that had printed off, I put it in the top feeder and I made a copy of the copy. And then I took the copy and I made a copy of the copy and a copy of the copy and a copy of that copy. Because I'm just so bored sometimes, I have nothing else to do with my time. But, you know, <laughs> make copies of copies and run up the copy bill. Um, no, really didn't take that long. Anyways, anyways. Look at, so this was the original. Here's number 20. <laughs> With some of the best technology we have available, by, you get to by the time you get to copy of a copy number 20, it's just a big blue blob, and you have to look really closely to maybe make out that there might be something like people there. You're not going to learn anything about our family by looking at the 20th copy of a copy. And you know what? It's a fair to say when we go to Scripture, I want to know that what I read here is a reliable re revelation of who God is. I, don't, I, want, I, don't, I am not content with a big blue blob of information about God. So is the Bible reliable? Or do we have simply copies of copies of copies with an accumulation of errors? How do we solve this when we don't have the originals? Now here's what you do. You go digging, and you get a bunch of manuscripts. And if you get as many copies of copies as you can, and then you compare them together, you see where the errors are when you compare a bunch of the copies that you have. Okay? So you want to get a lot of manuscripts that are really old, and you compare them. By the way, this is the same thing we do in every other historical document. Every historian who studies ancient history, this is the way that you would do it. And so, let's ask about the manuscripts. And to do that, I want us to compare the evidence of the manuscripts to to other ancient historical documents. So the first question is, you want to have really old documents. In other words, you want the time between when it was written by the author and the oldest copy to be as short as possible, okay? So here's one example. Thucydides is a well-known historian of, of, of ancient history, and he is, his writings are considered to be an authoritative basis for understanding history as it happened in the ancient world. The time between when Thucydides lived and wrote it down and the oldest copy that we have is approximately 1,300 years. 1,300 years from which we could get a significant accumulation of error. Um, Aristotle, the philosopher, from when he lived and wrote it down to the oldest manuscript that we have, there is approximately a gap of 1,000 years. Now, 
as Arist- if you're going to ask whose whose manuscripts are more trustworthy, Aristotle, because there's 300 fewer years for accumulation of errors. How about Homer's uh, Iliad? Uh, yeah, the Iliad written by Homer. Even better, half, double as reliable maybe as Aristotle from the time it was written down to the oldest copy that we have, only 500 years. Now, how about the Bible? The New Testament, the words of Jesus. We have manuscripts that are less than 100 years from the time they were written. Here's an example, one of the best. The Gospel of John, written about 80, uh, about 80 to 90 years after the birth of Jesus. Probably one of the last ones written, we think. Not we, I never had, you know, I just read what a lot of people smarter than I am say. 80 to 90. The oldest copy that has been found several years ago was dated at 125. In other words, 35 to 45 years after the original was written down, the oldest copy was written down that we have, and we have it. And you can look at it, and you can compare it back. Now, it's just a small piece because, I mean, that's been a long time for, you know, deterioration to set in, but when compared back to the original, we have that and more that is that old. If you're going to make a guess of which one of these is more trustworthy, you got to follow the evidence as where it goes. All right, now the next question you could ask is not only how old the manuscripts are, but how many manuscripts do we have? Because the more manuscripts you have, the more you have, the more comparison you have, and you can see how many errors there are or how many, how many errors there aren't. Well, Thucydides the historian, we have eight manuscripts. One of the reasons that Thucydides is considered an authoritative source of ancient history is because we have so many manuscripts. We have eight of them. And that's good. That, I mean, that's good. We're, we're not going to, you know, we're going to make a comparison here, but that's really good. Quality historical manuscripts. When it comes to Aristotle, Aristotle's got more. He's got 37 manuscripts. That's a lot of comparison to find. If you've got 37 that you can compare, you can find a lot of errors wherever they are that might accumulate, and you can get it down to what Aristotle most likely originally said by just running the numbers of what is most consistent with 37 manuscripts. How about the Iliad? Even more from Homer, we have 43 manuscripts of the Iliad, ancient manuscripts. Okay, what about the Bible? Here's what we're doing here, this little example. We're going to let one piece of paper, every piece of paper, represent one manuscript. Now, the manuscript might only be one page. It might be a small piece. It might be several pages long. Manuscripts are just kind of like that. But how many manuscripts? all of which are so important they are carefully stored in a museum somewhere so that they don't deteriorate anymore because they are precious, high-quality historical documents. How many New Testament manuscripts do we have that compares to the best with the Iliad? Like I said, I want to illustrate it for you. Some of you looked around, you saw some paper at the end of your row, and you said, "Uh uh-oh, we have homework today. No, you don't have homework. It's even more fun than that. If you have a ream of paper which represents 500 manuscripts, bring that up here at this time. Set it on the table. Set it on the floor, wherever you do. Come on, bring them up. Look at the end of your row. Look around you. If nobody's sitting in front of you, look right in front of you. There might be some there. Bring them up. Put them here. I want us to see, by comparison, how many manuscripts we have of New Testament documents. That stack's going to get pretty high. You can put it on top of the table if you want. For those of you who are counting, we have 5,600 manuscripts in the Greek language. We have 15,000 manuscripts in other languages. Wow. Now, the last question to ask, not only how old are the manuscripts, how many of them do, they have, do we have, but when you compare them, how do they compare, how many errors and discrepancies do we find between the manuscripts? Bible scholar and manuscript expert Bruce Metzger, who taught at Princeton, he claims, and he would be the expert, he claims that the copies of the Iliad by Homer 
are 95% identical. That's amazing. The copies of the New Testament are 99.5% accurate. When I look at the evidence, when I look at the evidence internally and externally, my conclusion, I'm sure the Bible is reliable. See, here's what we're doing. We're trying to present the evidence to show that the Bible is reliable. And just like we heard earlier in a courtroom, when eyewitnesses are no longer available, you can build a case based on high-quality circumstantial evidence that suggests, your, that, that brings your side. And juries can make decisions with no eyewitness evidence based on high-quality circumstantial evidence and have set innocent people free and sent guilty people to jail based on high-quality, circumstantial evidence that sets, makes a great case. And I'd argue with you and suggest to you that the internal and external evidence for the Bible is overwhelmingly supports, is overwhelmingly in favor of the Bible being a true and accurate representation of what the authors originally wrote down. I'm sure the Bible is reliable. And I want to challenge you a little bit. I say, I don't believe in manipulation. I don't believe in high-pressure sales tactics, okay? But I want you to think, though. If this is not enough evidence for you to trust the reliability of the Bible, then it is up to you to be intellectually consistent. And you must come to the conclusion that if we can't trust the historical reliability of the Bible, we also cannot trust anything we know and believe or have been told about any other document, person, or event in ancient history. Now, I do think these documents are reliable. And we can trust them to be accurate representations of ancient history. I'm not trying to belittle the non-Bible stuff. But if you're going to reject the Bible, you've got to reject everything. And you can't be sure about anything. This is just a simple summary of this. You heard the story of somebody who did his own research. Another guy who was well known for doing his own research was a, a journalist by the name of Lee Strobel. His wife came to Christ and he used his investigative journalistic skills to track down and talk to the experts and hear about this himself. His result was that the Bible is reliable, that Jesus is the real thing and he gave his life to Jesus and then used his own story to help people consider the evidence in a new way. He shares his uh, research and his stories in a book he wrote called The Case for Christ which has become a bestseller and if this that all fascinates you, I encourage you to get a copy. In fact, someone is going home today with a free copy. Take your bulletins out at this time if you would. Open them up and on the inside where it says prayer requests, go down to the bottom of the page. The best answer to prayer today. Okay, that may be a little bit exaggerated. Somebody at the bottom of the your prayer request page has a little green sticker. And if you have the bulletin with the little green sticker, wherever you are, you are going home with your very own copy of The Case for Christ right down here. There we go. Leanne's got the green sticker. Here we go. Pass it down. There she goes. All right. Hey, come back next week. I'm giving two away in every service next week. Your chances will double. Join us. You don't want to miss it. Or you can just get a copy of your own wherever books are sold. The name of the book is The Case for Christ. I am receiving no royalties or other benefits from your purchase of it other than your own changed life. Okay, I've presented the evidence. I want us to think a little bit deeper and then I'm going to send you home today. Think about this. This many manuscripts... This much agreement, painstaking detail by Luke to get it right. You know what I believe theologically? Is that God cares so much that you and I know him and know him accurately that God has been working overtime for the last several thousand years to preserve his words for us. That's how much... Yeah, you can clap and celebrate that. That's how much God wants you to have accurate information. But let me tell you, it's even more than that. God does not want you just to have accurate information. He wants you to know him. Amen. He wants you to take your Bibles. 
that generations of monks have given their lives to painstakingly copy so that you and I could have accurate copies of God's Word. And these guys would stay up late by the light of candlelight with their quills and accurately copy the Word of God. They would get tired and they would maybe accidentally slip or misspell a word, a tiny little error that most of us would just kind of cross off and initial and keep on going. And they said, no, that's not okay. We don't want to accidentally pr um, promote and mess up God's word. They would take that whole page that they had just copied with one mistake, tear it up, put it in the fire so that it would never get in anybody's hands because they wanted you and I to have an accurate copy because they knew what God was doing in their own heart. This is what God wants to do in your heart, in my heart, that he wants us to know him. He wants us to love him and he wants us to obey him. He wants us to be sure that he is God Almighty and that he is the best way to live. And it's not enough just to believe that it's true. If you believe that it's true, the next step is to open it up and begin to get to know the God who has so clearly, has so clearly revealed himself to us you're a skeptic and you're here because you're asking honest questions, looking for honest answers, and you're considering the evidence, here's your next step today. I challenge you to do it. Take a Bible. If you don't have one, I'll give you one. Turn to the Gospel of John. If you don't know where it is, we'll help you find it. It's also in the table of contents. You read John chapter 1, and then you read John chapter 2, and you read it all the way to John chapter 1, or John, John chapter 21. You get done, and you go back to the beginning, and you read John chapter 1 again. I read, just read John. John tells us about Jesus, and we discover as John writes, he says, I want you to know that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God who changes our lives from now and into eternity. If right now God's moving in your heart, you're feeling it, that is because God truly exists. He wants you to know him far more than you want to know him. As we pray today and get ready to go, I'm going to invite you to make a commitment. God, would you reveal yourself to me? God, I want to know you more. God, help me to read and to understand, but not just learn, but to know you. God, reveal yourself to me. I believe that's the first step in turning your life over to him. The God who gave his life for you is the God who wants you to give your life back to him. And you can get to know the living word of God through the written word of God. As you're thinking, as you're talking, if that's you today, you just keep talking to God. I want to talk to another crowd of us real quick. The crowd of us who came in here already believing, already convinced. Yes, in this series, I'm intentionally amping things up for us. Because sometimes we love this stuff and we love the arguments, we love the science and we love the debates and we love the proof and we love the evidence because then we say, see, there is good evidence. But let me tell you something, guys. If you're already convinced, if the way you live your life is not what's described here, you're convincing people to walk away from Jesus. And all your arguments and all your evidence isn't doing any good at all if you're not changed from the inside out by what you read here by the living Christ. And more important than evidence and arguments to win are real life changed hearts and lives changed by Jesus. And I believe when, this, when the conversation comes up, we need to have something to say and be able to engage the conversation. But let me tell you, you're not going to win anybody. You're not going to win any hearts with an argument. We win hearts with love, compassion, and real life genuine living for Jesus. If you don't have that, just shut up. No, I'm serious. You too need to get into this word, and you need to let the living word confront you with his written word. And with whatever God shows you and reveals himself to you, you hit your knees and say, oh, God, help me. God, help me. I can't do it without you. Because God, who revealed himself so clearly, wants you far more than you want him. That's how much he loves you. That's how much he cares for you. Pray with me. God, confront all of us, please. God, we thank you that there's evidence. We thank you that you've so clearly revealed yourself. Thank you, God, that you have worked so hard to painstakingly preserve your word so that we could have accurate revealing of who you are. God, we thank you. We are so grateful. 
God, I pray, would you help us to take your word seriously, to open it, to read it, and to be taught by you. God, help us to be confronted by you. God, help us to be changed by you from the inside out. And I pray, would you help us? Because we know we can't be perfect all the time, but God, would you help us? With your power, your spirit working in us and through us to live, to live out what we believe in you. And Lord, I pray, would you help us to be a great example to the people around us of what you're doing in us and through us. We pray in your name, Jesus. Amen.